success of the Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy and Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled, more games starring Crash were sure to be in the works. So, when Crash Bandicoot 4 was announced, not many were surprised necessarily by its announcement, but rather by the fact that it was a game that was announced and launched the same year it was announced. Trust me, that's a lot rarer nowadays for video games. And so, what's my consensus with Crash Bandicoot 4? It's about time. I have never played a game that I hate with all my passion, but also absolutely love every single bit of it with every fiber of my being. Confused? Well, let's get into the review and I'll elaborate. I'll try to avoid story spoilers since this game is still relatively new, and it will be getting a Switch and PC port within about a month's time. But without further ado, let's commence. Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time comes courteously from Toys for Bob and Activision, with Beanox assisting with some of the development as well as Activision Shanghai. Released October 2nd, 2020 for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time does not come from the makers of the Insane Trilogy, surprisingly. When the Insane Trilogy released, Future Tense, many speculated that Vicarious Visions would be the one to helm the Crash Bandicoot franchise going forward. But that sadly was not the case, and with the recent news of the fate of Vicarious Visions, it is sad to see their success in restoring two dormant franchises to be met with working in the Blizzard Mines for the rest of their days. But I digress. Toys for Bob did a fantastic job with the general style and charm of Crash 4 without a doubt. The decision to completely forego the rest of the franchise that occurred after Team Racing and start from right where Crash 3's 105% ending left off is interesting. And whether the characters that appeared in the later games will come back is one I'm curious to see in the eventual Crash Bandicoot 5. Gameplay wise, the franchise took major changes after the release of Wrath of Cortex, but Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time remains true to the original Crash Bandicoot formula while also adding new mechanics, gameplay styles, and references to the franchise's other games as well. So let's get into the story first, then gameplay tweaks and changes. And trust me when I say there is a lot to talk about here. The story for Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time takes place after the events of Crash Bandicoot Warped. Uka Uka, Cortex, and Entropy have been trapped within their prehistoric time period for well over two decades at this point. Which, I would like to point out, this coincides with how long it's been since Crash Bandicoot Warp released as well, which is a nice touch actually. Uka Uka, attempting to free the trio, successfully opens an interdimensional portal, allowing Cortex and Entropy to escape. But Uka Uka is left behind, drained of all of his power, and left on the floor, dead, as Cortex asks. From there, we cut to Crash on Insanity Beach, where Aku Aku warns him that something is up at Insanity Peak, and that Crash should go and check it out. After arriving at Insanity Peak, Crash discovers Lonnie Loli one of four quantum masks that together help keep the universe in balance. To close the dimensional rifts, the other four quantum masks, Akano, Kapunawa, and Ika Ika, must be found first, but they all reside in different dimensions and time periods of their own. And after seeing interdimensional portals open up, Crash, Coco, and company decide to go through the portals to stop whoever is opening up the portals in the first place and to save the multiverse. Along their travels, the group encounter familiar faces such as Tana Bandicoot and Dingo Dial, who are also traveling between dimensions, some without their consent, and at times help Crash and Coco unwittingly. Cortex also becomes a contender in this travel, but I won't spoil his reasons for joining Crash and Company on their journey through the multiverse. Ultimately, the game is more structured around similar to how Crash Bandicoot 1 was in that we have a central goal and not a collectible to collect like how we had in previous Crash games. The game does just about most of what I really want from a Crash game. First and foremost, it actually references the 105% ending to Crash Bandicoot Warp, which believe it or not, no other Crash game has done at this point. Wrath of Cortex for one doesn't even hint that it even happened. It's just sort of, oh, the villains are all back. Okay? Second, Entropy was a character I wanted to see more of, and honestly, this game delivers that with gusto. His portrayal as just another lackey to Cortex and Ukuuka always rubbed me the wrong way, especially with the Insane Trilogy where they added little details of sarcasm towards the fact that he is having to work for Dr. Cortex. And third, 
The characterizations are absolutely fantastic in Crash 4. All the characters receive redesigns in Crash 4 that change their appearances, but still looked faithful and were not as jarring as the changes that the Mutant Games had made originally. I absolutely love Tana, Coco, and Crash's designs, and the redesign of Cortex from less of a square head to a more rounded one seems a little bit more natural in this one than the colors that they use in the Mutant Games, I will admit. The personalities are all really interesting and mesh well together in cutscenes, which is always really nice when all the banter between the heroes can really play off one another, especially also with the villains. The story does fill in gaps too with extra playable characters in certain missions and explains why certain things happen to Crash and Coco in times at levels. The only main downside I have towards everything in the story is that Aku Aku doesn't really make much, if any, appearances in Crash 4, despite knowing the Quantum Mask. On the Quantum Mask front, they play an integral part to Crash 4's story and are present within most of the cutscenes. It reminds me a lot of the other Crash Bandicoot 4, Crash Bandicoot The Wrath of Cortex, with the elementals only, the quantum masks are more integral to the story, I find, rather than just being there for the sake of being there. The characterizations of personalities are a treat, with my favorite being Kapunawa and my second favorite being Lonnie Loli. All in all, the story won't set the world on fire, but it does a nice job in finding a way to work hand in hand with the gameplay of Crash 4, which, oh boy, are there some new gameplay tweaks and changes for Crash 4 to be sure. For Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time there are a total of four different gameplay level styles, each with something new brought to the table. Crash and Coco are the main levels, which play similar to the older Crash Bandicoot games, which new level gameplay comes in the form for Tana Bandicoot, Dingo Dial, and later in the game, Dr. Cortex. At the core of them all is platforming, and that is ultimately the name of the game. While there are some vehicles like the jet board from Crash 2 or Animal Riding that returns, they only make up a portion of a single level and are not outright their own levels like in Crash 3. I love this approach because as I mentioned in my Crash 3 review, I prefer Crash Bandicoot as a platformer first and a vehicle simulator second with Crash Team Racing being an exception, obviously. Crash 4 marks the game with the highest level count so far, with over 38 levels in the main game alone. Inside those levels are a variety of gems to collect, so why don't we first get into the gems and the Crash and Coco gameplay before we get into the side character gameplay. Core gameplay of Crash still largely remains the same. Use Crash or Coco to get through a level while breaking boxes and collecting gems. Added in are new spinning abilities for the regular spin when moving, and a low spin when standing still to help get boxes that have TNT crates on top, which is actually, believe it or not, really good for this game. Power-up rewards are gone from Crash 4, like how they were for Crash 3, save for the triple spin power-up that replaces the speed shoes once the player beats the main story, and the double jump from the previous game, which is now defaulted to both Crash and Coco, and unlike Crash 3, doesn't need to be activated at the apex of a jump thus making it infinitely better. Furthermore, the ability to parkour along certain walls and grind on certain rails makes for some varied level designs, especially when combined with the quantum mass powers. At the end of the stage will be a floating box counter or gem to indicate the end of a level, and the level will not end until the player touches that box or gem. The biggest new addition to Crash and Coco's gameplay though are definitely the quantum masks. Each one, which appear in stages based on preset locations, add a lot of new challenges and new ideas of level design for Crash 4. From Lonnie Loli's ability to phase reality in and out and make new platforms tangible or invisible, to Okano's dark matter spin that allows him to glide over long distances, Kapunawa's time slowing ability to allow time to be slowed for 5 seconds and makes it possible to break and bounce off nitro crates, and to Ika Ika's ability to flip gravity up and down, thus allowing for new platforming challenges in places such as bonus stages. Bonus stages return in Crash 4 too, each with their own puzzles and box count to keep the player on track, and death routes as of Crash 4 are now gone from the game entirely, with only colored gem paths remaining in a few levels in the game. But gems are also the only main collectible with a 
really big tangible reward besides another type of collectible in the levels that we'll get into later. But how you collect them has been changed since the classic trilogy. For one, there are now six gems per stage, each with a different requirement to obtain them. The first three are obtained by gathering the Wumpa Fruit that are inside of a specific level. These are the easiest gems to get as spinning Wumpa Fruit no longer makes them blow away and once boxes are broken, the Wumpa Fruit magnetize to either Crash or Coco instantly. The next gem is the Box Gem obtained for breaking all the boxes in a stage. Simple enough and comes back from the previous Crash games, but this gem is actually one of the most frustrating, if not the most frustrating gem to get in Crash 4, primarily because Crash 4 has an almost lethal fetish for hiding boxes, and with the new level details and distractions, it's easy to miss one or two by the end of the stage. It's like Cold Hard Crash, only for regular stages, and every stage is like that. The next gem is the Death Gem, which is obtained by dying less than three times in a single stage during that run. Deaths in Crash 4 are handled different if the player decides to play in Modern Mode, which removes the life system in favor of a death counter. But if the player wishes for a harder experience, they can choose a Retro Mode and play with lives still intact, where once you get a game over, you have to start that level over entirely. With the Modern Mode, you can die as many times as you want in a level. The only thing that will be hurt is your pride. Finally, the sixth gem is a hidden gem that is scattered around the stage somewhere to be found. This gem is often hidden in plain sight or behind tricky little walls with only a handful of the 228 gems being hidden rather well or outright needing a guide to find. Collecting gems is necessary to unlock the true ending like previous games, but also to unlock costumes for Crash and Coco from a specific stage. Each stage will have a costume for either Crash or Coco to unlock, and once the prerequisite number of gems are obtained, that costume is unlocked and can be changed in the world map for either character. What's even cooler is the fact that most cutscenes in Crash 4 are real time, so the costumes do actually appear in the cutscenes as well, which, believe it or not, some of them mesh rather well within the cutscenes. Only Crash and Coco have costumes, sadly, though, but according to the official Crash 4 art book, Tana and other characters were possibly going to have costumes as well, but it was scrapped, possibly due to time constraints. On that note, let's get into the three main side characters that all have levels in the game as well. All the side characters have one level dedicated entirely to them, and all remaining levels they appear in the game are hybrid ones, where they will have half of them be with that character, and the other half being Crash or Coco in their equivalent stage, only the Crash and Coco section is harder than the original stage. The first new character to play as in the game is Tana, who is similar to Crash and Coco in that she has a spin kick, double jump, and a ground pound move for iron crates. However, Tana also has a wall kick move and a grappling hook that can activate or break crates from afar or latch onto enemies and pull them away. The second playstyle comes from Dingo Dial, who instead of a flamethrower has a vacuum gun. With this device, Dingo Dial can hover for about 2 seconds, suck up crates off stage, or suck up TNT and lob it at enemies, nitro crates, or stage hazards, with barrel TNT being plentiful around the stage if needed be. Best part is that the explosions from Dingo Dial that are lobbed from his vacuum do not hurt him, but if there is an explosive nearby that explodes because of the explosive you launch, that can kill you. Finally, there's Dr. Cortex, who can use his ray gun not to kill enemies, but rather to turn them into either a solid platforming block, a gelatinous bouncing block, or a cloud of vapor in the case of one stage. Cortex has a dash move in place of a double dump, which can hurl the doctor headfirst and can't be used to kill enemies, otherwise you'll die instantly. And has him float over ledges for a bit, thus making him for more puzzle-based platforming challenges. Cortex I find is the hardest of the new characters due to the lack of a longer jump or of a double jump in general, and the lack of a lock-on function with his ray gun makes aiming rather difficult, and thus you just end up spamming the shoot button a lot of the time. Dingo Dial's levels are absolutely my favorite of the new gameplay styles, with Tana being a good second. 
If you've collected all the gems from previous stages though, you can also decide to play through the inverted level of a stage, which the inverted stages are interesting in that it flips an entire stage around and gives it a unique art style depending on which dimension the player is in. The inverted stages also bring in the inverted gems, of which there are six just like the original gems in the original stage. And some of the inverted stages become required to do in order to get some of the later costumes in the game past the halfway point. And inverted stages don't get unlocked until the player has beaten Dr. Embryo's boss first. On the bosses front, I will say that Crash 4's bosses actually rather disappointed me with how easy they are overall. Much easier than the classic trilogy, that's for sure, and not as common as one might think given how long Crash 4 is. But the number of levels make up for what I believe was the main focus of the game, which is levels first, bosses second. Plus, there's 38 stages in the main game, but there's also 21 other stages known as flashback levels, unlocked by grabbing the flashback VHS tape within a Crash or Coco level specifically and not dying until you get that tape. These flashback levels are all levels that chronicle the events of Crash Bandicoot and Coco Bandicoot's experimentation before they rebelled, as well as being some of the hardest levels in the game to complete. Completing these levels can earn the player a flashback relic, a sapphire one for completing the stage normally, a gold one for breaking at least 90% of the boxes in the stage, and a platinum for breaking all the boxes in the stage overall. Gathering all the flashback tapes earns the player a new costume for Crash and Coco respectively, and is needed to unlock the 106 true ending of Crash Bandicoot 4 it's about time, as well as a nice little epilogue within the game, which is always a nice little epilogue to see. Okay, so that's a lot to take in, but we're not done yet, because now we're gonna get into what I absolutely despise about Crash Bandicoot 4 and that is getting 106%. See, the main games and main levels, along with the inverted levels, only account for around 98 to 100% completion of the game. To get 106%, you need not only get the flashback tapes with platinum flashback relics, but you also need to do the time trials and gather the newly added insanely perfect relics. Let's get into time trials real quick since they are basically the same from previous games but have more difficult times to complete and have added a new tier than the Platinum Relics of old. Now, the best times are now the Amethyst Relics that are Toys for Bob times, which are almost ridiculously impossible to get for the average player, I find. Since the developer times are now the highest times, the player needs to get at least Platinum to get 106% for the game, which is not easy. Finally, there's the Insanely Perfect Relic, also known as the Bane of My Existence. To obtain these pains in the butt, the player must beat a level without dying and get all the boxes and Wumpa Fruit gems in the same run. Die once and you must restart the entire level over again, which normally wouldn't be too bad if, again, the boxes weren't hidden so much or if loading times weren't so abysmally long in Crash 4. At the time of this review, I am still working on 106% for Crash 4, but haven't done so yet due to the insanely perfect relics and the platinum time relics. I can do it after hours and hours of trying but I just haven't had the time lately. So far, my time in the game is over 50 hours in Crash 4, and I never thought I'd have a Crash game that would take that long alone to complete entirely. Take my advice on this. Unless you really want a tease for Crash 5, which in and of itself is only 30 seconds long, do not go for 106% in Crash 4, and make sure that you play on modern mode rather than retro mode. You'll save your sanity on this, trust me. Luckily, my sanity has been kept in check though, thanks in part to the stellar soundtrack of Crash Bandicoot 4, it's about time, so let's move from rage to soothing, shall we?
Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time employs the use of a very dynamic soundtrack that changes as the stage progresses. Composed by Walter Mayer, the composer of some of the Grand Theft Auto and Killzone games, the Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time soundtrack is easily my favorite soundtrack of the Crash franchise by far. In an interview with GameSpot, Mayer stated that he was given rather free reign to make the soundtrack for Crash 4 and was given an early prototype and alpha footage and gameplay to make music around that. Somewhat similar to how Stuart Copeland would compose the soundtrack for the Spire of the Dragon series. Mayer remained true to the series by even including small nods and musical parts of Josh Mansell's themes inside the new compositions, which are always fun to hear. I can't not talk about Offbeat and the amazing job that soundtrack in the Mardi Gras inspired stage does. Besides that standout track, I do love Dr. Entropy's theme once more and Cortex's theme too, which still continues the trend of using Dr. Cortex's main theme from Crash Bandicoot 1 is also present in this game. The dynamic music in the stages also changes depending on which mask power you are utilizing, and it's always cool to hear what they will do to the music. Each mask makes the music somewhat different from what it used to be, which is really interesting and it's rather subtle in its changes. Lonnie Loli adds a filter over the music, Akano speeds it up, Punawa slows it down, and Ika Ika inverts the music. Overall, the soundtrack complements the new voice work in Crash 4 as well. Crash 4 uses a highly new voice cast with some returning favorites to bring together possibly the best vocal performance for a Crash game since Twin Sanity. Returning to voice Cortex is Lex Lang, whose performance is definitely his best to date as Cortex, I find, and once again edges out Twin Sanity for me. Fred Tatascore returns as Dingo Dial, as well as voices Akano and Ika Ika's happy persona. Greg Eagle performs a great Aku Aku once more, with the game even throwing a dedication tribute to the recently departed Mel Winkler before the credits. Corey Burton returns as Engine and Nitrous Oxide and Andrew Mordago as Fake Crash, and finally Misty Lee as Polar. Now, for the slew of new actors, as all the other characters receive new voices in this game, starting with the main bandicoots themselves, we have Scott White voicing Crash and Eden Regal voicing Coco. Dr. Nefarious Tropy is now voiced by J.P. Karliak, with a female entropy being voiced by Sarah Tanser. Tana is now voiced by Ursula Tahirian, with Roger Craig Smith now performing Dr. Embryo and Cortex of Scientists. The Quantum Masks are voiced by Richard Horowitz for Alani Loli, Cherise Booth for Kapunawa, and finally, Zeno Robinson voicing the depressed Ika Ika persona. Additional voices were also done by Yuri Lowenthal, John Olson, Edward Bosco, Sally Safoiti, Jonathan Lipow, Keith Silverstein, and Chris Fries. With overall, the amazing vocal performance and dynamic soundtrack helping to bring together one of the best experiences and most detailed experiences that Crash Bandicoot has had to date. So at the beginning of this review, I stated how Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is a game that I absolutely hate, but absolutely love. Honestly, the base experience is really fun, and I find that if it were not me going for 106%, I would put Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time as being one of my favorite Crash games, period. But the 106% grind has worn me down to the point I will say, definitely grab this game, but don't go out of your way to 106% it unless you really want to get frustrated. With new ports coming to PC and Switch at a reduced price coming out on March 11th, I can now see this as the perfect time to wait for Crash 4 if you've not already gotten it, but make sure you grab it when it does come out. Not to mention, the PS5 and Xbox Series X and S versions, which will no doubt improve the load times of Crash 4 and make the reset experience, if you do go for 106%, a whole lot better. I can't wait for the eventual Crash Bandicoot 5, and I will love to see where the series goes under the hands of Toys for Bob. Only thing that really needs to change though is that the grind for true completion needs to be kind of dialed back a bit and I say lay off on the hidden box placement and you will have yourself probably the best Crash Bandicoot game period. Either way, Crash Bandicoot 4 It's About Time is best to enjoy and is definitely one of the best new experiences with the orange marsupials in a very long time. But anyway everyone, I'm gonna end it off right here. This has been Neuronium, 
and I thank you all for watching this review of Crash Bandicoot 4. It's about time, and this Crash Bandicoot mini marathon. The next time we return to the Crash series, we'll be looking at no the last Naughty Dog game created, and that is Crash Team Racing and the Beanox remake, Crash Team Racing Nitro Fuel. See you all next time. Oh,